Thanks for the introduction. My name is Xin Lu. I'm a postdoc at Emory University. And I'm really excited to come here to share my research on using 2D materials as a potential new platform for quantum information science. The reason I put a question mark here is because there are still lots of, or let's say, compared to well-developed systems such as MV Center in Diamond, there are still lots of open questions here, unresolved answer, waiting to but waiting for more researchers to work there. And that's why actually in the meantime, keep attracting people, including me, to explore 2D materials for quantum information science or QIS. So that's why I put a question mark here. But in the following presentation, I hope I can convince you why it is interesting and I hope you can enjoy it. Um, so first of all, I would like to take this opportunity to uh, acknowledge my two advisors. My PhD advisor, Professor Chiu Hua Xiong, and my postdoc advisor, Ajit Rivers Tower. And to me, they are not only mentors who are always there supporting me and guiding me, they also show me the um, difficulties or happiness as a group leader, and that's what keeps encouraging me in my own career path. And uh, I would also like to thank my group member, like group mates at Emory, especially Xiao Tong and Sudipta. And Xiao Tong will join Rice. He has joined Rice University as a postdoc. And Sudipta will soon start her own group at IIT Kampu in India. Um, so speaking of monolayer or layer material, we need to go back to the first monolayer, graphene. So graphene is a flat monolayer of carbon atoms. They are tightly packed in a 2D honeycomb lattice. Well, in fact, for a long time, it has been believed that strictly two-dimensional crystal could not exist because they are not thermally stable. The melting temperature of these 2D thin film would decrease rapidly as the <coughs> thickness decreases, and eventually they will either uh, segregate, uh, sorry, like segregate into islands or decompose. But obviously, there are two persons who don't buy it, like Professor Guy and Professor Norisalo. In year 2004, they show that isolation of graphene, the monolayer of carbon atoms, and they show that the graphene is th thermally stable at room temperature and it is of high uh, crystalline quality. And in fact, the initially when uh, the method they used to produce graphene is it's rather simple. All you need is a scotch chip, which one can buy in any lots of stores, and a uh, graphite um, crystal, or in principle, a pencil should work. So the next thing one need to do is just like do scotch tape folding, sticking. And eventually, that puts it on a substrate. So the amazing thing is that one can see it with your eyes, which is the monolayer is just about 0.3 to 0.4 nanometer, like 10 to the power of minus 10 meter. This is because of interference effects. So one need to choose the thickness of the substrate carefully, uh, also the refractive index. In addition to being atomically thin, graphene is uh, one of the softest and hardest materials in nature. And it's a semi-metal with high mobility of charge carrier. As you can see here, once charge carrier are injected, uh, there's rapid um, decrease of resistivity, and that's the indication of high mobility. And the transport of graphene is more naturally described by Dirac equation. And if you look at the, the, the momentum space, the, the relation between uh, energy and the momentum of electron is actually linear. And starting from 2004, the first, 
isolation of graphene, there are many interesting research going on in term, uh, on these strictly thin two-dimensional thin film, including one of the results on quantum high effect demonstrated in 2005. And even up to today, like 15 years later, there's still rich physics there. So for example, recently from MIT, they published the twisted by layer shows, shows that the superconductivity with a magic angle around 1.1 degree. Just think about it, graphene is not a superconductor and graphite is not a superconductor either, but somehow one can artificially make it to have zero resistance. Well, that's amazing, right? But graphene is not the exceptional case because uh, later from a Columbia group, they show that in twisted by layer tungsten disinite, a semiconductor, but of course with another angle, but the, that is detail. So similarly, the zero resistance state or the superconductivity <coughs> can be observed as well. Um, so by bringing up tungsten disinite, here I would like to let you know that Besides the semi-metallic graphene, there are broad properties of two-dimensional layer materials, uh, including semiconductor black phosphorus, uh, dichalcogenize, and barium nitride insulator is also a layer materials. And due to this broad property, there's uh, many research going on, different aspects, including, let's say, spin value physics in transition metal dichalcogenide. I have to say that the valley physics, the valley index or valley tronic has started long before uh, graphene, before the monolayer. But earlier, for example, in silicon, the valley are degenerate. In other words, you can't tell the difference between this valley. But later in this two-dimensional hexagonal lattice, one can, the, the valley are located at the end of the Brewin zone, the K minus K valley, the K minus K point. In, other words, that one can uh, really distinguish between valley and use valley as um, like a bit of information you can do it, uh, which I will introduce uh, in detail later. And uh, there are many other research like superconductor and magnetic material in really thin film. Um, so people really explore it in down to monolayer, and which shows that, for example, in niobium selenide or chromium iodine, which in bulk, they are a superconductor or a ferromagnetic. And in down to monolayer, although the TC change, but still, um, it is a superconductor or ferromagnetic material. Okay, so what I'm focused on is actually single photon emitter or quantum emitter. So the birth of research interest in single photon emitter of flare materials started around 2015. Um, so what is single photon emitter? It's just basically a photon that emitted one photon, uh, sorry, it's a, a source that emitted one photon at a time, only one source, uh, one photon. So um, experimentally, people use hybrid uh, brown twist setup to confirm that a light source is really a single photon emitter. So what we usually do is giant light to a 50-50 um, non-polarizing beam splitter. So which means that the photon has 50% to be reflected and go to detector one, or another 50% to transmit it to go to detector two. So if this light source is a single photon emitter, it is impossible to detect photons simultaneously at both detector. So if one uh, plot the second order correlation, for example here, that at zero time delay, which means uh, at the same time for both detector, that we will expect to see a dip if it is a single photon emitter. This dip, we call it uh, photon anti-bunching. And experimental wise, if this dip, the value here is less than 0.5, we will consider it as a single photon emitter or a quantum emitter. So this is actually measured from a localized exciton in monolayer tungsten disinite. In addition, being a single photon source, it also uh, has some special property. For example, the language is pretty sharp. So compared to the localized exciton, it's about one tenth the language. So here I need to clarify something. Oh, so clarify between the difference of um, localized exciton and delocalized exciton. So these. Uh, the exact origin of single photon emitter in layer material or in tungsten disinite is 
is still an open question. So, but basically, we will consider it. It is an exciton localized by a shallow chap, like here. So only at a certain point, a certain location, it emits. So we consider that exciton emits from this localized potential well as a localized exciton, and that's localized exciton. For the localized exciton, basically, one can expect to see it anywhere in the sample, as long as you excite it. Yeah, so that's the difference here. To observe a single photon emitter from a localized exciton, we can use light. And that's like photo-induced emission. And one can also do like electrical injection. Like you can use a saw string to inject electron hole pair. And that means that in this system, one can potentially realize quantum LED. And on the right side here, actually, I think Actually, from my point of view, I think this is a very important and very interesting aspect for layer material at a new platform for the quantum information science. Because these, OK, so let me first briefly introduce. It's here. Below, this is a thin film on lots of pillar. So locally on pillar, one can uh, induce strains. So on top of the pillar, you see the bright spot. That's from the uh, quantum emitter. So which means that we can, in principle, induce and scale up this quantum emitter, which is actually pretty hard, let's say, for MV center in diamond. Like it's very hard to do more fabrication or scalability on MV, uh, diamond. And uh, here is another example to use so-called string tonics to, to, to induce the quantum emitter. It's between the gap of the narrow rods, one can see bright emission. So these properties are, are very desirable, let's say, in terms of quantum information science. But in addition to that, there's also some interesting aspect of using layer materials as a, uh, as a host for quantum emitter. So at this point, it's very important to go back to the properties of the hose. So the hose is a tungsten disilinide. It's a typical um, transition metal dichalcogenide. So it goes with the common form MX2, with M denotes to metal, and X is the calcogen sulfur selenium. And normally, there are three kinds of stacking, 2H, 3R, and 1T. And I actually work a lot on 3R stacking during my PhD. But here, uh, in this presentation, I will focus more on 2H as it's more, uh, more, more, more common in nature. So the unique property of transition metal dichrochrogenide is the spin valley physics, as I just uh, briefly introduced. So first of all, what is valley? So valley refers to the local maximum or local minimum in the electronic band structure. And in analogy to spintronics, the valley index uh, was proposed to, to uh, work as a bit of information. Uh, like one can store or uh, uh, read in or manipulate information from this discrete uh, momentum of the crystal. So if we zoom in this valley here at k point, let's see here. Um, so if we look at the valence band here, first off, we see a large splitting. This splitting is like more than 400 milli electron volt in tungsten disilinide. And we also see that because of splitting, these band, like they have different like spins, spin up here, spin down here. And because of time reversal symmetry, um, if we just look at the valence band maximum, at k point is spin up, at minus k point is spin down. The spin valley locking effect means that if we want to flip a spin from spin up to spin down, it has two ways. It, I can either flip, but this is too large, so kind of quench, or it flips to, uh, to another valley, but the momentum here is too large. So that is like kind of indicate that the valley index is pretty robust. Or in other words, we say this is the spin valley locking effect. Um, and another interesting properties of these spin valley physics in transition metal dichrochrogenide is that these valley index can be addressed by light. So 
it means that light with a different helicity, like sigma minus, sigma plus, they talk to different valley. So for K valley, for example, it only emit and absorb sigma minus polarized light. And if we shine sigma plus polarized light to K valley, it will not talk to it. it will not, there's no interaction at all. The amazing thing about this single photon emitters in um, embedded in the monolayer is that in, it inherit this structure, uh, inherit these properties from the host, unlike like MV center. The MV center itself does not inherit so much property from the diamond. So here, as you can see, if we apply out the plane magnetic field, that the emission from the single <coughs> photon emitter, it changed like 0, 1, 3. But if we apply it in plane magnetic field, even after three Tesla here, we don't see much different. That's because a tiny magnetic field like three Tesla in plane, sorry, in plane magnetic field like three Tesla, it's too small compared to the 400 milli electron volt there. That's why there's almost no difference. So this is actually an evidence or implication that the single photon emitter or the localized exciton it inherit the structure or the electronic structure from the host monolayer. But uh, okay, so that's also a meaning that the ball radius of this localized exciton, oh, sorry, the the uh, localization, the confinement length of these, uh, the scale is actually larger than the ball radius. Otherwise, it can't inherit the structure from the bulk. So at this point, let's have a brief summary of TMDC single photon emitter to see what we can use for uh, quantum information science. So ideally, a single photon emitter has to be like stable, bright, pure, and indistinguishable. But I have to say that even the well-developed or very mature system is not perfect. Nothing is perfect so far. So on one hand, that people want to push the limit. And on the other hand, that we're exploring more uh, material platform. Um, so in TMDC single photon emitter, probably the most obvious unique property is the host itself. It's a monolayer, which means that the quantum emitter is at the surface. It could be very sensitive to the environment. So could it work as an outer sensitive um, sensor for quantum sensing? On the other hand, also because of the layer material structure that one can actually form, one can actually make a rays, which is like not, uh, not practical for many other systems. So can this work for quantum simulation? And in addition, due to layer structure, that it has very high flexibility in terms of fabrication and also the optical addressability of valley index. So this could possibly work as a normal material platform for quantum network and quantum communication. So in the following that I, uh, my research here is going to um, answer the question or try to explore some possibility. So the first part is about initialization. So why is this important? Let's say if it is for quantum network or even for quantum communication, oh, sorry, or for quantum computing, the first thing you need to do is to initialize the bit or the read-in. And the next thing is manipulate and realize quantum gate or readout. So initialization will be the first part. And the second part, I'm going to show you that the single photon emitter it can carry a single charge, a single spin, and what's more, it can carry a single dipole. And there is some interesting dipolar interaction there. And besides that, um, last part, I'm going to show you that sometimes we do see some interesting physics there, like entanglement between single photons and chiral phonon. OK, so this is uh, the first part in terms of optical initialization. So just now I talk about the valley index is very robust and uh, looks like one can really store information by using the valley index. But in fact, the valley index is only well defined for zero center of mass momentum. So what does it mean? So we, it means that here we will say it is zero of mass center of uh, zero center of mass momentum. But let's say when we create an exciton electron hole. Uh, pair, 
the, if the electron is shifted a little bit here, and as long as it's within the light core, it can still emit. But in this case, it will have a finite center of mass momentum. And in this case, as, as, the, uh, as the exciton has a finite center of mass momentum, it will see the electron hole exchange interaction. And this in exchange interaction will add as an in playing field that mix the two valley. So in other words, when we initialize the system in whatever way, optics or electronics, but if we probe the system after the valley mixing time, the information will be lost. And, and I have to say that this is there no matter for delocalized or localized exciton. The reason we can still see valley polarization for delocalized exciton is because the delocalized exciton has shorter lifetime. And, but for localized exciton, a single photon emitter, it has a longer lifetime. And we can actually see this uh, exchange in direction effect from just simple photoluminescent measurement. So let me give an example here. So we start from the degenerate state, like sigma plus, sigma minus from k minus k uh, valley. And due to exchange interaction, that we will have a splitting here that we call fine structure splitting or zero field splitting. And this splitting leaves the degeneracy. It means that the degeneracy state, will, you will basically see two peaks here, for example, here. So the splitting value is about 500 to 800 micron electron volt in tungsten diselenide. And because of this fine structure splitting, the two peaks are linearly polarized, and they have a 90 degree like the polarization angle is 90 degree different. And if we apply a magnetic field to the system, and once it is larger enough to overcome the exchange direction, we can actually see the circular polarization restore. OK, so you may ask that looks at exchange it anywhere, and looks that we can't uh, initialize it in this layer material platform. But that's not actually um, true, because it is there for neutral exciton, but we can actually create a singlet positively charged exciton to avoid this problem. So the exchange I uh, introduced earlier, if without, without this actual hole, which is like positive charge, of course, it will have exchange and flip to another valley. But here, as the two holes from a single state, which means that it, the electron will not see a net exchange in direction. So um, in this way, the exchange is quenched. And that's singly and positive charge quantum dot. Oh, so which means that if we use light to optical initialize it, and these should stay robust because exchange is quenched. So how about negatively charged quantum dot or negatively charged single photon emitter? Uh, so it is a little bit more complicated here because depending on where the actual electron sits, it can be either uh, intervalley trion or intervalley trion. But no matter in what case, um, the here as it doesn't form a singlet state, so the uh, electron hole pair can still flip from k valley and minus to minus k valley. So in other words, if we uh, initialize system in this left configuration, but due to exchange, it can flip to the right configuration, which means that one cannot uh, have very good holistic control. So with that in mind, we know that to really demonstrate efficient optical initialization, we need to work with singlet charge, singlet positively charged quantum dot or quantum emitter. So with that in mind, we fabricate a uh, ambipolar tungsten dicena FPT device. We mainly work in the uh, P-dope region because we want it to be positive charge. So here I show two uh, gate-dependent uh, photoluminescent color plot. Um, so first of all, let's look at here, the D1 or D2. So we see that, like here, 
The two peak is spectrum wandering together, or you may hear some word called spectral diffusion, or yeah, actually that's the same thing. It's like the two, uh, the quantum, it's actually the characteristic of quantum dot or quantum emitter as um, it sees the fluctuation of the environment, the energy change. And if they change in the same way, that means that they see the environment, the local environment they see is actually the same. So this is actually an indication that these two lines, they are related to one potential chap. And on the other hand, the energy spacing here is uh, about 600 micron electron volt. So we assign D1 and D2 to neutral um, single photon emitter. And in the meantime, we see that like 10 milli electron volt above D1 or 10 milli electron volt above uh, D2, there's a single peak which spectra wander at the same pattern. It's, it has just one peak. So the indication to us that it could be a positively charged uh, single photon emitter as there's no exchange, there's no splitting. So here, that's what we assigned it to be the singly positive charged quantum dot. And um, we see the coexistence of neutral and charged quantum dot, which means that the charge loading in this uh, FET device is not perfect. Um, the coexistence means that the neutral chap or neutral potential dot, a neutral dot, it capture or release an extra hole in a much time, a much faster time scale compared to the integration time of the spectrum. But sometimes occasionally we do see this anti-correlation as you can see here that the neutral uh, dots are weaker and the charge dots are stronger and here charge is weaker and neutral are stronger. This is like further supporting that our assignment that the S peak and D peak, they are related to one potential chap. The next thing we are going to explore is to apply magnetic field to the sample to observe the Zeeman effect. So Zeeman effect uh, refers to the splitting of spectral line in the presence of magnetic field. And uh, in th this material system, usually there are three contribution. And uh, for spin, as if we are observing the bright exit on the spin will not contribute. And there's like intracellular contribution to the G factor, sorry. The, that's uh, related to the band character. And here, the band, both, uh, both conduction band and valence band from the, uh, the, the band structure from the D orbital of the metal atom. And here it carries a, a angular, orbital angular momentum of two, and uh, it will contribute to a G factor around four. And the phase winding will mainly uh, contribute to exciton, uh, sorry, electron hole from different valleys. So if we are observing the combination from one valley, and this is not so important. So it's mainly the second, um, second element here that contribute to the G factor, a uh, dimensional quantity that characterizes the magnetic moment, uh, resulting uh, magnetic moment. So um, here we see the valley Zeeman splitting. As the D1, D2, the neutral peak, has a zero field splitting. So it will be a parabolic, parabolic uh, dispersion. And the aspect, as it has no uh, fine structure splitting, so what we observe is a linear X-shaped dispersion. This is actually further confirmed that there's no exchange, or at least the exchange is very small, smaller than the resolution of our detection, which is around 50 micron electron volt. And then in terms of the G factor, for neutral dot, we have G factor around 10. And this is actually consider, uh, uh, this is actually very uh, consistent with earlier measurement. And this is uh, suggesting that our assignment is correct. And for the charge quantum dot, we observe larger G factor. At time being, we don't have a clear explanation on why the G factor is larger. Um, but a larger G factor, on the other hand, we're thinking that it could be a sensor, let's say, to sense a, a tiny magnetic field, although 
it needs to work at low temperature. And um, on the other hand, we do notice that in terms of G factor, let's say for molysilinide, no matter it's like for delocalized or quantum dot, mm -hmm. it has similar G factor. But for tungsten disilinide, there is a difference. Like for delocalized, it's around four, but for a quantum emitter, it's larger. So why is that? Like we are actually thinking in our group that probably is relate these localized exciton, a single photon emitter is actually from dark exciton, but that could be the details here. And um, one can actually do a measurement to confirm that. So how about like polarization? That's G factor, so how about polarization? So even if we excite with linearly polarized and non-resonance laser, we quickly see the peak gas circular polarized with the application of an outer plane magnetic field. So here red means sigma plus and blue means sigma minus. So this state, for example, if we take uh, these as an example, the red color, minus k double arrow up means that uh, it's an electron hole in k valley, and one can initialize a resident hole with this spin in minus k valley. So this indication is that if we shine circularly polarized light to the sample, can we just successfully or efficiently initialize one branch only? So we change the polarization to circular base. This is sigma plus, sigma minus, or linear. Um, so here we cut the high energy part, just focus on one uh, side. So we found that the, um, with circular incident, we can only see one branch. That's actually implying that we can successfully or efficiently initial, uh, initialize a single hole with a certain spin. And if we pump a linearly polarized light, this, that's considered the superposition of sigma plus and sigma minus, we will uh, see two branch. And here is a um, comparison between charge and neutral dot. Uh, under sigma plus, sigma minus, and linear excitation. So for neutral dot, we would not see much different between different excitation because there's exchange interaction. We can't actually control or initialize it. Okay, so that's the first part. So here uh, we show that a quantum emitter, a localized, emi a localized exciton in tungsten disilinide can carry a net charge and a resonance beam. And we also, uh, for the first time, show that optical initialization of a single spin can be performed efficiently in 2D materials. OK, so a localized exciton can carry a single charge or a net spin. And here I'm going to show you that it can carry a single permanent dipole. So to realize that we need the hetero bilayer system, um, molysilinide and tungsten disilinide here. So due to the type two alignment, the electron will accumulate in moly and hole will tend to uh, accumulate in tungsten. So which means that when we stack a sample, um, after the sample is made, the dipole direction will be fixed. So for example here, uh, this is tungsten on top and molly bottom, and the dipole will only in this direction. So this permanent outer plane dipole, when we apply an, out, uh, an electric field, the energy can be tuned by the electric field. And if once we, we increase like uh, the density of these excitons in the sample, and these dipole-dipole interaction, as they're in the same direction, they will kind of like repulse each other. Which means that, for example, here, if you look at the right schematic, let's say we have a localized chap. Well, this is the energy you need to pay to create one exciton or one excitation in the localized chap. And when we want to put two excitation in the same chap, we need to pay the energy cost due to the on-site dipole-dipole um, interaction because they will repel each other. And this is kind of like resembling the dipole blockade and read per atom. The difference is that the dipole here is much smaller, which means that the confinement needs to be tighter. 
And uh, in our sample, we do observe this uh, by accident or doubly excited state. As you can see here, we label it as I double X, I double X. And uh, it is at higher energy, about two milli electron volt higher. That's because the on-site repulsive interaction, we need to pay the cost. And uh, then if we extract the uh, integrated intensity as a uh, function of power, we see that, uh, and then fit the data with the power law function, we found that the coefficient of I double X is roughly two times of I X. That's actually an indication of bi exciton. So here we use the word bi exciton, but I need to clarify it because uh, usually in semiconductor, the people think that bi exciton is a bound electron uh, bound state, which means that um, it will lower the energy if it forms a bi exciton. But in fact, here, uh, the bi exciton state is you need to pay more energy because of the dipole. But we still use the word by exciton because uh, these two states, they are related, although you need to pay more energy. So here is uh, the time chase, and we see that the singular excited state or the exciton state and the by exciton state, they have the same jittering pattern because they're in the same potential well. They see the same <laughs> local fluctuation. And this is the tuning of the uh, exciton and by exciton states and um, as they have the permanent uh, outer plane electric uh, the, the dipole so they can be tuned and in terms of g factor we found that they are also like have the same value and which further confirms that they are uh, the same species and uh, by extracting these uh, energy different here like two milli electron volt we did a simple calculation and found that these two dipole in the, uh, the potential well, uh, it has an interdipole distance of around seven nanometer. Okay, so here, uh, just now I demonstrate that a single photon emitter in layer material, it can carry a single dipole. And um, these on-site dipole interact, a dipole-dipole repulsion can cause somehow like single photon nonlinearity, which could be in, uh, interesting for further research. And the dipole-dipole interaction can also add like for, for Boss Harbor quantum simulation later. Okay, and then it comes to the third part. It's about entanglement of uh, single photons and chiral phonons. So here uh, in two sample, we observe around A, quantum dot group or quantum emitter group that below one uh, neutral quantum emitter, exactly 21.8 milli electron volt below that, we see another doublet group, which spectrum wandering at the same pattern and then they show up at the same voltage. And it is always precisely 21.8 among A groups. So the first thing coming to our mind is, so could it be a phot uh, phonon replica because the energy is too precise? So with that in mind, we go to measure the Raman spectrum. In the in tungsten disenoline from Raman spectrum, exactly at 21.8 milli electron volt, we see a phonon with E symmetry. So it's a, uh, in plane vibrational mode, uh, yeah, you can see here that this is the metal tungsten. So it's the selenium, the calcogen, it moves in plane either in x direction or y direction. So it's like a degenerate mode, as you can see here from uh, calculation phonon dispersion. It is a degenerate mode at gamma point. So, yeah, so that's a phonon replica. And for phonon replica, that one important parameter is um, the Huang Ries factor. It's a string of uh, using to calculate exciton phonon coupling. So we extract the uh, intensity of the, the phonon replica and compare it to the parent peak, the A peak. And this is the Huang Ries factor we extract 
for most uh, quantum dot group is around 0.3. It sounds small, but it's also like one order magnitude larger than gallium arsenide quantum dot, which means that the exciton phonon coupling in this uh, transition metal dichrochrogenite system is pretty strong. And here we perform a uh, power dependent measurement. Uh, so we found that for the parent peak and the phonon replica, they exhibit the same slope. This is very important as if they exhibit different slope, which could indicate there are different species. So this further confirm they are, uh, they are phonon replica and related to the same chap. And this is uh, from B field measurement. We found the G factor also are the same. The interesting part or the puzzling part is from the polarization. So this is the uh, simple schematic um, we use to measure the polarization. So quantum dot, one of the important uh, characteristic of quantum dot, quantum emitter is it blink, just like star, it blinks. So the, it's somehow it's like very, sometimes it's very dark, sometimes it's very bright. So to eliminate that uh, fluctuation in terms of measurement, we use Wollaston prism. So such that the, um, instability in terms of uh, illuminescence will not contribute to the error bar of our measurement. We measure um, the polarization of the parent A peaks. It's linearly polarized and the two peaks are orthogonal to each other. And as expected because of the uh, fine structure splitting. But the puzzling part is from the phonon replica. No matter in linear base or circular base, it doesn't depend on the uh, measurement collection angle. So which means that it is um, polarized, but that's kind of like weird. And from, from the polarization measurement, we extract the Stokes parameter and construct the density matrix for uh, the phonon replica. We compare it to a mixed state and found that the phonon replica, it is very close to a mixed state with fidelity of 99%. But how can a coherent Raman scattering process lose the information of the polarization? That doesn't sound reasonable. So we go back to the phonon itself, maybe something weird there. So the phonon, as I just mentioned, it's a doubly degenerate phonon at gamma point like we can consider x direction or y direction. And in principle, it can superpose to become a chiral phonon. Um, the tungsten, the metal atoms, uh, stay still here. And the selenium atom, it will rotate in either clockwise and counterclockwise. Uh, that means it carries some chirality. And in fact, we can actually see it from uh, polarization resolved Raman scattering measurement. Um, the dashed line means uh, the incident and collection are in the same um, configuration. If we can see phonon with uh, the dashed line, which means that the phonon will not carry chirality, but in fact, if we see uh, from the opposite or opposite helicity, we see the phonon. From the copolarized, we didn't see it, which means that the phonon scatter of the phonon carry a, a chirality or carry an angular momentum that it makes the scatter light change from sigma plus to sigma minus. So how is this related to the unpolarized um, emission? So um, let's start from here. The unpolarized hysteria is mainly because we have two indistinguishable paths. So from the neutral exciton, we have sigma minus, sigma plus, and then they split between two peaks and have uh, a 90 degree, like the linear polarized light, and it's a 90 degree axis. So it's here, we put a plus minus i. And the phonon has uh, angular momentum, like plus one, minus one. Due to the phonon selection rule, minus one phonon can only talk to sigma plus photon. It will not interact here. So here, if we just look at the right branch, a sigma plus state photon scatter or emit a phonon with minus one angular momentum, and it will become sigma minus, scatter a, a photon with sigma minus. And similarly, from the left branch, 
uh, it will sigma minus photon interact with uh, plus one photon and scatter to sigma plus photon. So these two paths at zero B field, it is indistinguishable. And as we don't have the access to, uh, to, to get to know the phonon uh, information, so if we need to trace out the uh, phonon system, and what we actually get is, in fact, one should expect uh, unpolarized emission here. And ac that's actually why it caused our unpolarized, that's actually why it, it, we observed unpolarized emission earlier. But in the meantime, we are also thinking that these two paths are indistinguishable. If we somehow break this indistinguishable path, for example, let's say we apply a magnetic field, and these two are not degenerate anymore, what will happen? So that's why we are uh, applying magnetic field and do this measurement. And what we found is that when we apply a magnetic field, the unpolarized uh, phonon replica, it gets circularly polarized, which means that um, the degeneracy is broken and the entanglement is not there. And uh, as a result, uh, consequently, that's why we will see the uh, polarization of the uh, phonon replica get recovered. Yeah. So uh, that's the uh, unpolarized <coughs> emission of this uh, entanglement. And this chiral itself, it could be also very interesting as well for like, let's say, non-reciprocal propagation of energy. Um, yeah, so that's uh, going to be the summary of my work. So here I demonstrate like from three different aspects in terms of optical initialization, like dipolar interaction, and uh, unpolarized emission as a result of chiral phonon and photon entanglement. And it could possibly lead to many new research direction, but it's still an uh, emerging field waiting for lots of researchers and students to in this field. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you for the next talk. Questions? Huh? Okay, so if you could show the slide, uh, <coughs> show, back up and show the slide that has the density matrix that's uh, on polar, is that one? That's the data. I want to see that. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Next one. Forward. Forward, please. Which one? You're, you're going you're backwards. backwards. Oh. So, uh, you want to see your density matrix then. And Here? the conclusion that you get, next slide, that, that you get the uh, unpolarized density matrix. Keep going. That one. Yeah. Uh oh. Okay, this is all standard. And uh, this is a. Uh, absolute copy of all classic ways in which you get an unpolarized signal uh, after you trace out one of the faces. <laughs> and you're offering that as the explanation for your practically unpolarized experimental observation. But in the first place, there's lots of ways to get an unpolarized experimental observation. Noise, junk. So uh, the fact that you found an unpolarized explanation doesn't mean much to me. Now on the next slide, the next slide, you're showing that there is a, a correlation with polarization when you put on a magnetic field. Mm -hmm. But if you want to make a case about entanglement, don't you have to have a two-way statistic where you have some kind of a correlation mm -hmm. that happens with one of them and what happens with the other? So you can't do it with something which is just a measurement on one space, which I think this is. So you, do you have evidence for entanglement, or are you saying you have evidence for entanglement? Okay, that's really a good point. In fact, when we're submitting this paper, that's actually one of the questions from the referee. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so um, in fact, the, we. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want to explain. Otherwise, that. I would know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like I, I need to admit that we don't have the evidence or direct evidence to show the entanglement. You are absolutely right that we would be. Better, much better if we have that. But in, we have actually thought about how to measure it as we need to get the information of the phonon within its coherence time, which is, uh, yeah, which is pretty hard. So earlier we were thinking that, let's say we give another laser and let it up convert it. And then we did some simple calculation to see that 
from the emission rate, like as it's not bright enough, looks like it's impossible at the current stage. So yeah, we don't have the evidence to show the correlation. So here, uh, and just now you also have another comment that there are many ways to get unpolarized light, right? Yeah, so we also realized that. Um, so that's why we apply the magnetic field here. We want to say that even a small magnetic field can destroy that. That could not be, let's say, the phonon oriented at random direction that caused the um, polarized emission. It's um, due to the entanglement itself, and we are breaking that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I think. Uh, I have a question. Yeah, yeah you go first. Uh, you have lots of plots with energy. It looks like it's a, a spectrum with energy resolution of order 100 volts. Are those just optical measurements, or how, how do you do that? You haven't explained the experimental technique used to. You have lots of plots that are gate voltage versus energy, but yep. they find energy measurement. What's the experimental technique for doing those measurements? So uh, are you asking about the resolution in terms of the energy? Yeah, what do you detect? Ah, OK. So um, that's OK. On one hand, we have a high resolution spectrometer. spectrometer. And on the other hand, we are. Sorry? Is photon measurement? Yeah. And on the other hand, we are also collecting through fiber. So it's like point to point source, confocal glass. So, and then the limitation there is from the uh, equipment that is around 50 micron electron volt. Uh, I have a question about the origin of those quantum dots. Mm -hmm. so do we know whether there are certain type of defects or impurities that cause those localized states? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, so far, I think there are several um, Origin, like at least that's what people believe in. Like it can either be defect or string. You know, pillar can create that. Or recently, people start to think that if you play with bilayer, those twists, the more potential could, could create the trap. And personally, I would think like that's my personal opinion. In this field, there's no an absolute answer yet. Uh, I don't think point defect alone can create that because point defect, like think about the atom itself is like pretty small. So if point defect itself can create that, that means that the localization lens for the exciton is smaller than the Bohr radius, that the exciton will not inherit the value physics. So I will say that probably is a combination of defect and also locally in layer material can't avoid the strain. One comment about that. So, if, if you have a shallow defect, you would expect the defect to have the character of the host material, right? So, would that be a possibility to trap it in a shallow defect? A shallow defect? You mean it's not a point defect? But well, a, a shallow point defect. So, some the transition levels are very close to conductive uh -huh. band or valence band. So, it mo looks more like an effective mass state of your bulk material. Mm -hmm. So it has all of the properties of your bulk material. Would that be a possibility or not? That could be. That could be. I, I can't say for sure. That could be one of the reasons. And it will be better, like let's say in the future, one can really correlate. Exactly on this spot, we see a single photon emitter. And from maybe high resolution TEM, indeed, we have, uh, let's say, a vacancy of selenium there. That would be the perfect thing that I'm expecting that will happen one day. Uh, are you compared to the spectrum you have you know, with the, you know, the word like the E-field, then huh? you have this uh, kind of you know, X-shape? Oh, OK. This one, right? This one? This one? 
This one. No, this is not B fuel. So uh, it's in the which part? Like the polarizing zero. Polarized. Oh, yeah, I think I know which part. This one. Yeah, yeah. OK, OK, I see. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I noticed that actually an episode uh, near, near you know, the zero magnetic field actually there. That looks like a real you know, splitting is there. Ah, and yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's two <laughs> yeah, so in fact, if you, you draw a line here, it's actually here. Yeah, but, but there's, there's, there's a gap, you know, in, in, the, in there, right? Uh, I don't know what indicate actually there's, a, there's an interaction. That? You know, at the. B zero B field. So you know the the quant well, the eigenstate is not minus k up or you know k down. It's the it's the superposition of the two. So are you thinking that probably this is like a parabolic dispersion and then we have a small gap here? Yeah, it's it have a small gap. It like yeah, in fact, it looks like from this presentation. Uh, sorry, from this scale here, it looks like a small gap. But I think it's probably because of um, we, I, we are plotting it in a polarization base. And then that I scale it a little bit. But if, if you really think about uh, if I plot it in the intensity, that actually you will not see it. It is actually, I would say, it's a little bit broad. Like this peak is around probably 200 micron electron volt. And that's why probably make I, I do admit that it looks like a gap, but it is actually not. If let me show. Oh, so sorry. What, what, you know, what kind of detectors you have for this? What is? Oh, sorry. This actually not. So that's what I want to say. It's not the gap. But is it the same as the, the previous one? Is yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All, also the S2. Oh, uh, yeah. That one is S2. It's not S1. It's S2. It's slightly broader. And so you say the light is unpolarized at that? that yeah, that's a good point. Okay. Yeah. It, it's unpolarized at zero magnetic. And so your color scale just has that as well. That's true. That's why I said if. Zero divided by zero. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> That's why I said if we see it in the intensity, not in the polarization, that is clear. Okay. Uh, so in the previous slide, you said that the Uh, I think it will affect in terms of the brightness, like close to zero. Hmm? You also do my brightness you mean like intensity? Uh, emission intensity and also the G factor. Okay. Yeah, and you haven't tried different angles? We have to do with other angle, but okay. if it is close to zero or close to 60, you see bright emission. And uh, the G factor would be different. One is close to 6, and the other is close to 15. And uh, if there's some random angle in between, let's say, 30, which is not aligned, that you will also probably will not see bright emission. Like the emission is very weak. That's the major difference <coughs> in terms of angle. But let's say if you want, or from our experiment, there's not much different from like 1 degree or 2 degree. Any other questions? If that's not please, let's have our speaker again.